the um, Sabi, you're the only one on the stage, I think, who in, in on the briefs around these specific First Amendment grounds actually had your case brought taken up by the Supreme Court, here, right? Can you talk a little bit about the the slants and the, and the contours of, of your case, and then we'll get into some deeper questions on that. Sure. So I applied to register a trademark for the slants, my band. Um, but the government ended up not liking that. They quoted an old 70-year-old bit of law called uh, Section 2A of the Lanham Act, saying you can't register marks that the government considers scandalous, immoral, or disparaging. Now, in this case, uh, they said the term slant was disparaging, but only when it was used by an Asian-American band. So in other words, they said I was too Asian to use this term. <laughs> Seven and a half years later, I was before the US Supreme Court. Um, arguing for our, for our rights, and it actually, the federal courts rejected all of our other arguments, uh, even arguments saying that, look, the, the trademark office is using our race against us. They didn't care about any of that, they just wanted to talk about the First Amendment. And when we brought up the fact that it was chilling speech, um, that the law violated our, our, you know, our First Amendment rights because of viewpoint discrimination, um, it got taken up by the court, and that's where we won uh, unanimously in 2017. And, and so okay. your efforts here were essentially to kind of reclaim a slur, a slur right? You, you guys were, in some ways, ironically using this term. Yeah, in some ways, and I would also argue that the term slant is not inherently racialized. Sure. Like, you know, you, we could talk about a perspective or an angle or that sort of thing. But according to the government, because of the speaker, because I was Asian, all of a sudden it became racially charged. And, and so, going back to this kind of like true threats distinction, right? You know, how do you think the government should try to adjudicate these questions? Of, of uh, you know, how often, as an artist, as someone who's creating, um, you know, who's creating art and putting it into the world, you know, what what should the role of the government be in moderating it that way? I, I think, <laughs> if at all, I think extremely limited, if at all. I mean, here's the thing: like, art is meant to be on the edges, to push our boundaries, to cause us to question. It, it oftentimes serves as a mirror. And what we find is, um, artists, and par particularly artists from marginalized communities, we don't get the same benefit of the doubt as others. I mean, you know, we, we brought up Eminem here. A white rapper is treated much differently than a black rapper or a brown rapper. Uh, we, we found the case with, uh, y you know, it, whether it's rap music or, I mean, and in particular rap music because um, music produced by black and brown communities tend to get treated differently than music produced by white communities, um, genre and otherwise. Uh, I, what we find is that it's because those, those in power, they just simply have different experiences. They might not have the same intention. They, their intention might not be to suppress speech or to like discriminate based on people's race, but when you don't have that lived experience, we don't understand what it's like to be in a community that doesn't experience the same privileges and rights as others, you're not gonna provide that benefit of the doubt. You can't connect with that same life experience. That's why I don't say that dumbass term, N-word. Mm -hmm. It's dumb. The word is nigger. Mm -hmm. It was nigger when it was on the Jeffersons. It was nigger when it was on All in the Family. It was nigger when it was on Sanford and Son. And because of that freedom in art and television, I saw as a child racism challenged on television in a radically different way than it is today. It's swept over the day. It's covered over. It's something we don't talk about. We handle it um, much like a middle-class family that doesn't talk about their problems versus confronting those things, and that's an artist's job. Mm -hmm. Artist's job is to say, why not, to push the edge, to push the limits. And, um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm tired of losing, as an artist, my freedoms of speech based on the whims of white America. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it seems to me that to be white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant in this nation gives you the ability to make or change the rules at will. Mm -hmm. And the rules just need to be the rules and fair for everyone. Now, Mike, you talked about two. You've talked previously about two different elements I wanted to drill into here. What, the, the first of which is this idea of, and, and Simon, you were just talking about this too. The idea, the power of art to kind of right injustice or to force conversation, yeah, to absolutely. bend and move a spectrum, yeah. and why it's important then for artists to be able to express things that the mainstream may feel yeah. uncomfortable with or feel off. But